hi everyone welcome back to mint baby youtube channel so this video is about the development of head and neck so let's get started so by fourth week the neural crest cells will migrate to the future neck so first of all uh, let's see the diagram so this is a head bulge and there is cardiac bulge so the first diagram the neck or the part is missing only there is head bulge and cardiac bulge so what will form the neck region is the pharyngeal arches and the pharyngeal arches is formed by the fourth week so, so the neural crest cells will migrate and it will form the future neck and this neural crest cells will form the pharyngeal arches so in the second diagram we can see the head bulge the pharyngeal arches and the cardiac bulge so in the diagram we get questions like image based questions in order to identify each structure so in the diagram a correspond to the pharyngeal arches b for the head bulge and the c for the limb bud and d in the diagram correspond to cardiac bulge okay so i'll talk about pharyngeal arches so pharyngeal arched it is mesenchymal condensation so the mesenchyma is derived from the neural it is derived from three structures the neural crest cells the paraxial and the lateral mesoda is derived the mesenchyma and what is pharyngeal arches pharyngeal arches are just the condensation of this mesenchyma so how many arches we have we have there are five pharyngeal arches that is from 1 2 3 4 and six earlier there was uh, like in starting there is six pharyngeal arches one two three four five six but the fifth arch will disappear so there are total one two three four the fifth arch disappears so there is sixth arch so in total we have five arches which is one two three four and the sixth arch so in pharyngeal arches it is mesenchymal condensation so the outer layer of pharyngeal arch will be made up of ectoderm and the inner layer will be made up of endoderm so the spaces between the ectoderm layer of the pharyngeal arch it is called cleft whereas the spaces between the endoderm it is called pouches so in uh, in this diagram we can see there is 1 2 3 4 and 6 arches so the pharyngeal arches and the outer layer is ectoderm and the inner layer of the pharyngeal arch is the endoderm so the ectoderm spaces we have it is called cleft whereas the endoderm sp space it is called pouches so basically we have 1 2 3 and 4 cleft and four pouches so now i'll talk about the derivatives of pharyngeal arches so the pharyngeal arch have certain components in it so there is cartilage component and later on this cartilage will ossify into bone so muscles get attached into the, into bone so there is muscle component as well as the nerve supplying the muscle and the artery component so these are the component inside each pharyngeal arches so so now we have to know in each pharyngeal arch that is first second third fourth and the sixth pharyngeal arches what are the corresponding cartilage component the muscle component nerve component and the artery component so i'll talk about that so in the first arch the artery to the first arch it is a maxillary artery okay and the cartilage of the first arch it is it is called meckel's cartilage so we have malleus incus anterior ligament of malleus sphenomandibular ligament maxillary mandible the zygomatic sphenoid and temporal bone coming out of this cartilage and the nerve to the first arch is the mandibular nerve and the muscles in the first arch 
uh, is the sense of mastication which, which is temporalis masseter medial and lateral thyroid and uh, other muscles like anterior belly of digastric mylohyoid tensor palatine and tensor tympanic muscles okay so that was about the first arch so artery is maxillary artery nerve is mandibular nerve and cartilage and the muscles so the second arch pharyngeal arch the artery to second pharyngeal arch is the stapedial artery and the cartilage it is called the rich richard cartilage and from the cartilage the structures we have to uh, uh, memorize we can memorize it by we have to remember like 5s that is stapes styloid process stylohyoid ligament the small horn of hyoid bone superior surface of hyoid and the nerve of second arch is a seventh nerve or the facial nerve and the muscles are muscles of facial expression the posterior belly of digastric muscle the stylohyoid auricular muscle and the stapedius muscle so that is about the second arch and if you look into the third arch the third arch arteries are like three we have the common carotid artery internal and external carotid artery okay and the cartilage or the bone component is the inferior surface of the hyoid that is superior surface of hyoid was under second arch the rest part of hyoid bone which is the inferior surface of hyoid and the greater horn of hyoid correspond to the third arch and the nerve to third arch is the ninth nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve and the muscle uh, only one muscle which is stylopharyngeus muscle and now if you see the fourth arch and the sixth arch both together it corresponds to the cartilages of larynx but not the epiglottis and we have to understand that epiglottis is not derived from the pharyngeal arches epiglottis is derived from the mesoderm of the hypobranchial eminence of fourth arch so it is derived from the mesoderm and it is not derived from the pharyngeal arches so again back uh, if you look into fourth and se uh, sixth arch so it's uh, it corresponds to the cartilages of larynx except the epiglottis and the fourth arch nerve will be the superior laryngeal nerve whereas the sixth arch nerve is the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the muscles of mm, this fourth arch is the muscles of pharynx but the palate and the cricothyroid so muscles of pharynx as well as the palate and the cricothyroid and if you look into the sixth arch it, it, it is a nerve is recurrent laryngeal nerve and the muscles of larynx but except the cricothyroid because the cricothyroid muscle of the larynx is supplied by the fourth arch so fourth arch uh, muscles are muscles of pharynx palate and cricothyroid muscle whereas muscles of sixth arch is muscles of larynx except the cricothyroid muscle and it is very important to note that in the fourth arch if we talk about the arteries so fourth arch right part it is subclavian artery whereas the fourth arch left part is the arch of aorta and the sixth arch it is the pulmonary artery also on the sixth arch left to the distal part ductus arteriosus is the artery okay so this is all about the derivatives of pharyngeal arches and it is very very important because usually questions are asked and 
for example even in the clinical scenario based questions can be asked for example if a boy comes and he has got a defect in the first arch so which all structures are involved and out of uh, like mcq which structure is not involved so in order to answer all these questions we have to un uh, know all this what are the cartilage component the muscle component nerve component artery component of all the pharyngeal arches so in this uh, diagram it is a pharyngeal arch arches we can see the first second third fourth and the sixth pharyngeal arches and the component as i said in each pharyngeal arch so this is one pharyngeal arch so in this second uh, diagram so in this each pharyngeal arch there is a cartilage component which then transform to bone then there is the muscle component supplying or getting attached to this bone and uh, the nerve supplying the muscle and the aortic innervating the muscle and the aortic arch also so there is four components the cartilage the muscle nerve and the aortic ar artery component so now some applied of pharyngeal arches understanding so there is treacher collin syndrome and there is peary robin syndrome so this treacher collin syndrome it is the first arch derivative the pharyngeal arch derivative it failed to differentiate then we go get the syndrome called treacher collin syndrome so because the first arch derivatives are not formed the clinical features of a patient suffering from treacher collin syndrome it will be facial asymmetry the coloboma of lower eyelid and also in second diagram you can see the boy is having some external ear anomalies as well so these will be the clinical features where is in peary robin syndrome peary robin syndrome there is only problem with the mandible so the primary anomaly in peary robin syndrome is the mandible is not formed developed properly so there is hypoplastic mandible or small mandible so that is a primary uh, anomaly and because of that because of the small mandible the tongue will go posterior so there is loss of dorsis posteriorly uh, displaced tongue which is the secondary anomaly of peary robin syndrome so the because of tongue going posterior the tongue will obstruct the palate fusion so the palate will not be formed properly so because of that obstructing uh, the palate fusion then there is formation of cleft palate so these are the sequence of events happening in peary robin syndrome the primary uh, anomaly is the hypoplastic uh, mandible causing loss of dorsis and cleft palate so peary robin's uh, syndrome uh, uh, the diagram it was that so only the mandible is not well developed so the clinical features will be hypoplastic mandible and this because of this hypoplastic mandible it causes the posteriorly displaced tongue which is called glossoptosis and it obstructs the palate fusion causes the cleft palate so that was the two uh, clinical situation peary robin syndrome and treacher collin syndrome so now when i was mentioning about pharyngeal arches i said there is endoderm and ectoderm layer so the gap between ectoderm is called cleft and the gap between endoderm was called pouches so now we'll see the derivatives of Uh, just before we saw the derivatives of pharyngeal arches now we sh we can see the derivatives of endodermal or this pharyngeal pouches what are the structures coming corresponding to each pouches so there are there were four cleft and four pouches so now we'll look into pharyngeal pouches so from the first pouch we have the middle ear and the eustachian tube and from the second pouch it is tonsillar fossa and the tonsillar epithelium and from the third pouch the like 
in third pouch there is two as component so there is ventral uh, forming the thymus and the dorsal part of third third pouch forming the parathyroid 3 and this parathyroid 3 will become the future inferior parathyroid and why because uh, because it is formed along with thymus so this thymus uh, we know thymus is formed in the neck and it will descend to the thorax so while descending uh, to the thorax the thymus will drag the parathyroid 3 also so thereby the inferior par from parathyroid 3 will become inferior parathyroid and from the fourth pouch that is ventral and dorsal so from ventral end ultimobrachial body will form and this uh, will form the parafollicular cells of the thyroid whereas in the dorsal parathyroid 4 will form and this parathyroid 4 will form the superior parathyroid so it is very important to note that from superior parathyroid is formed from the fourth pouch whereas the inferior parathyroid is formed from the third pouch okay so so here i said from the fourth pouch ventral aspect ultimobrachial body and this will form the parafollicular cells so but if we get a question like parafollicular cells are derived from the priority should be given to neural crest cells if it is in the option so over the ultimobrachial body so this is a diagram we can see that from the first pharyngeal pouch the tubo tympanic crests, the middle ear, the and the station tube is formed, and the second pharyngeal pouch or the endodermal pouch, the tonsil, larfus and the tonsil epithelium is formed, and in third pouch, there is formation of thymus and parathyroid three, which will form the inferior parathyroid, and the fourth pouch, ventral part will form the ultimobrachial body. Which can which will form the parafollicular cells and the fourth parathyroid, which is forming the superior parathyroid. Okay, so the thymus will then descend into the thorax along with the parathyroid three. So some clinical correlation there is Dijorge syndrome. So in Dijorge syndrome there is twenty two Q eleven deletion, twenty two chromosome Q eleven deletion. So, because of Dijord syndrome, the, the thing is that there is third pouch is failing to differentiate. So, from the third pouch, thymus and the inferior parathyroid will not be uh, formed properly in a patient with Dijord syndrome. So that was about Dijord syndrome now and also about the derivatives of endodermal pouches. Now if we see into the derivatives of ectodermal or the pharyngeal cleft. So there are also some derivatives from the cleft part. So the from, from the first cleft there is external auditory meatus and from the second arch. So we can see in the diagram from the first arch. Uh, uh, this ectodermal cleft external auditory meatus is formed and the second arch it will grow and from second arch will fuse with the fourth arch sorry the sixth arch so and it is forming a see, projection growing downwards from the second arch till the sixth arch so it is forming the cervical sinus and later on the cervical sinus will obliterate because the cervical sinus is formed uh, and it obliterates later only the uh, we have derivatives from the first cleft other all the cle uh, uh, clefts will obliterate so there is a condition like bronchial sinus or cyst and this in this diagram this boy is having bronchial sinus so what is this condition and the cause of this condition is the cervical sinus which is supposed to get obliterated it persists 
so the cause is the persistence of cervical sinus usually the location can be the cervical sinus which can be present anywhere along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle but most commonly it is seen below the ankle of mandible as in this case of this boy so this persistence of cervical sinus this this is called bronchial sinus or bronchial cyst so that is the end of this video thanks for watching stay tuned for next videos thank you